Will you be able to do that? Yes, you will. If your mind is empty, if your readiness to learn is at fever pitch and your readiness to teach uh, or diagnose is at a low, low level. Michael Trout is the director of the Infant Parent Institute and longtime therapist who trained under renowned psychoanalyst Selma Freiberg. Michael is a widely published scholar. His work includes the co-authored text, See Me as a Person, Creating Therapeutic Relationships with Patients and Their Families. A focus of that book is observation and wondering about the person, for example, a child that we're working with. You suggest that the adult observer ought to become empty and quote, brilliantly stupid. So what does that mean? We should be stupid when we are observing kids? Well, it's a strange idea, I understand. And certainly I'm not saying that we have to be, uh, to forget everything we've ever learned. We take into any observation in a classroom or in a therapy room or on a home visit, we take there all that we know about children and grown-ups and how they respond and so on, that's to be sure. But if we think we're so smart when we begin such an observation, we put on blinders without ever realizing we do it. We begin to, to categorize both grown-ups and children, sometimes even diagnosing them in our mind, but at least categorizing them. And as we do that, we begin to eliminate possibilities so that the story, for example, of the child or the story of the grown up that we're observing um, is the less interesting to us because we now think we already know. I, I've kind of, we don't say this even consciously to ourselves probably, but certainly we often mean it. Oh, I've got this guy pegged or I've seen children like this before. And the truth is, we haven't. We may think we have, but I guarantee you, if you're any good at observing, you will someday admit you've never seen the same child twice. And you've never seen the same parent twice. So let's say that you're coming on a home visit onto a front porch and there's a really mad guy standing there. And it's a dilapidated place to be in the first place. The hood is up on the car in the driveway. It doesn't look like it's been driven for a while. There's crap around the, the yard. And you already, I mean, the home visit hasn't even started. And you already think you know all about these people. Will you be able to imagine when that father threatens you, either with words or with, I don't know, a broom, broomstick? I've been threatened with all sorts of things on front porches. Um, will, you, will you be able to, re, to wonder at least, at least be curious for goodness sakes about why? Will you be able to reimagine him, to mentalize him, to reimagine him as, I don't know, maybe a really scared little boy whose dad beat the crap out of him and you're a big guy with a beard and a lot of authority and a really nice car that pulled up in his driveway. And you see what we've got now. Will you be able to do that? Yes, you will. If your mind is empty, if your readiness to learn is at fever pitch and your readiness to teach uh, or diagnose is at a low, low level. So in that situation, it might be easy to see how the home visitor, or if that family was entering a school, um, how that teacher would be concerned about the child. And, and some red flags might come up about the environment that they're in. So I'm wondering what our, whether we're a home visitor or a therapist or a teacher, I'm wondering what our understanding of the parent has to do with our work with the child. Oh, that's a wonderful question. But it's only a meaningful question at all if you're actually interested in understanding the child's story. If you really just want to classify the child, fill out the government papers, uh, get them signed by everybody, some baloney, um, sorry if I sound prejudiced, 
some baloney treatment plan for the child that really is just designed to get something on paper and get it up to the big wigs. If that's your aim, then, um, then you, you might as well just cash it in because you're not going to help this child. If you really want to know the, the child's story, then you, of course, are passionately interested in the parent's story. You want to know where this child came from. You want to know, for example, let's just say that, that, there, that, that this child, unbeknownst to you or hardly to anybody, was a twin. And that twin died in utero. And mom and dad don't talk about that much. And it's not on the school records at all. But that has changed this child's life. It may change, for example, the, the eagerness he has to sit real close to somebody in the classroom. He wants to be in twos. He's interested in doubles. He doesn't know why he is. And you as the teacher are real annoyed because you want the kids to sit in their rows, for God's sake, and be nice, polite kids. That's just a ridiculously small detail that I would think would make a huge difference in your teaching not to mention in how you see the child. You mentioned the kind of formal assessment or diagnostic assessment that we might be inclined to prioritize over observation. And, and a student might ask, well, if we don't do that, how do we know where to start? How do we know where the kid is at? How do we know what to do with the child if we don't start with that test? Oh, I love that, the way you put it out. We don't, I wouldn't know where to start. And of course, I'll probably just annoy the dickens out of your students if I say, ah, oh, sweetheart, that's the best imaginable place to start where you don't know what to do, where you don't know where to, where to start. Because if you really don't know where to start and you don't panic and you don't grab for the nearest solid concrete, so to speak, wall to grab hold of, which also could mean diagnostic category to grab hold of or treatment plan or educational plan. You always do this with autistic kids, for example. If, you're, if you can resist the urge to grab something solid and just stay in that place where you don't know, you don't know who this kid is and you don't know what to do, then you can breathe and you just might open your eyes. And what you might discover may surprise you a great deal. You see the child in a different light than you did a minute ago when you were so fretful and worried about doing the right thing, doing the, the helpful thing. Now you're just trying to understand what is the child's story? Did this child's daddy die during the mother's pregnancy for him? Did this child's daddy die last week? Did this child's mom and dad fight this morning? Those things you don't even get into in diagnostic classification ceremonies. You only get into when you relax into not knowing and then wondering. I love that you brought up here something that can interfere with that not knowing and wondering and that can drive our worries about what to do with the kid or where to start is our own panic about our jobs. And, and I think that transitions nicely into something that I wanted to ask you about. In a recent lecture of yours that I've had the pleasure of reading, you summarized some of the psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott's work with children, explaining that, quote, we, what we do around the child may be even more important than what we do to the child. You also hear describe Selma Freiberg's ideas about how to be with young children and both emphasize sometimes implicitly Claire Winnicott's concept of holding. Now, as you point out, this might not offer us much in the way of concrete strategies that professionals are seeking. To you, what does it look like when someone is being with or being around a child therapeutically? <clears throat> By the way, I think but then I'm biased. I think that a treatment plan or an idea about what to do does emerge. It's just that it's not as patently obvious as it is if somebody's handed you a written down 
educational uh, strategy or psychotherapeutic strategy for this child. That's real comfortable. Holding is less comfortable because you're not so sure. And some of your students might be interested to know that Donald Winnicott, probably the most famous and renowned psychoanalyst and pediatrician in Europe at the time, uh, walked into this, these hostels. They were places where kids whose parents were trying to save them from the nightly bombing of the Germans of London. Uh, their parents got them out of town into these places. And the kids had the audacity to react to being given, thrown away like that. They behaved very badly and nobody knew what to do with them. So they bring in this big wig, Donald Winnicott, to tell them all what to do. And you know what he did? He, he did about what I would do, which is drive everybody nuts by not doing anything. And worse, not telling them what to do. He encouraged them instead to look at the world around the child, meaning not only where does he come from, what has he experienced, what has he seen, but what do we provide for him in the way of what he called a facilitating environment every day? Do we make him feel safe, not just from bombs, but from his own heart, which is breaking? Do we make him feel stable? Does he know for certain what we're going to do? So he tried to get those people, first by showing them, which drove them crazy, because they would, they would leave a, a Donald Winnicott consultation session saying, he didn't do anything. He just sat there playing with these pipe and the kids gathered around. And he would later explain, what do you think it means to a child who's lost both parents, at least as far as he knows, because they're gone, that's for sure. Maybe they're dead, maybe they're not. What do you think it means to him to sit with a grumpy old man and play with his pipe? It means, Winnicott would say, a momentarily at least safe, stable environment. And so he tried to turn people's attention in that direction. He didn't have a word for it, really. It was this young social worker on the staff, whom he later married, smart guy, uh, who gave it the term holding. And she would say, that's what I think we do with these kids. We wrap ourselves, not physically, though maybe sometimes that, but mostly we wrap ourselves metaphorically and spiritually around these children. We create a sense of safety and certainty. And that can mean things as, as uh, concrete as we do the same things at the same time every day so that they know exactly what to expect. We read to them from the same book for five days in a row, and we read in the same way, and we let the children who need to sit near us sit near us each and every day so that there's some predictability to their world. And that was holding to them. To Freiburg, who took it many steps further, also, by the way, never using the word holding, I would only know that that's what it is because of, I got to study with her and I got to learn how she really thought. But she would say, when you go into a home, for example, where there's a blind child, you're seeing not only that the child has no connection with his outside world because he hasn't yet figured out how to make the world become available to, in his brain. He hasn't reached out for it. He doesn't even know it's there. You can shake that rattle in front of his face all night long and he won't reach for it until you've taught him to reach for it. And once he's touched it, now his hands become an extension of his blind eyes. And he will now know that there are objects out there. But until that happens, for a blind child, there is not only no, no rattle, there's no mother. There's no mother. She can call him and he won't come. She can call him and he won't even turn his head. And by the way, with many blind children in those days, it meant they also didn't crawl or walk because they would have no, inner, no eagerness to attain an object, a person or a, a toy. So Freiburg was one of those weirdos who would step back, go slow on the diagnosis. A little side note, by the way, in those days, we thought we knew everything about blind kids, that they were dangerous, violent, almost always autistic and really should be institutionalized. 
Freiburg went in with none of those. She went in with that empty mind we referred to earlier. And so she wondered what, what can the world feel like to a child who doesn't know where any objects are. He doesn't even know that there are objects. And secondly, what do you suppose it feels like to be a mother of a child who won't look at you, who won't crawl towards you, who won't respond to your voice? And she believed that the first order of business, therefore, was to hold them both. And holding them both meant teaching the child, first of all, about objects so that he could become connected with his outside world. And secondly, to empathize with mother's sense of aloneness and sorrow and tragedy that she had a child that she thought hated her. A funny little note about hating is that many of these children in an effort as they began to imagine objects out there in an effort to retain them, would put them in their mouths. Turns out sighted child children do that too, but they give it up. Sightless children don't give it up. And part of putting things in your mouth might mean putting your mother in your mouth, which if you're a mother feels a whole lot like biting because it is. And so mothers would begin to believe that their children hated them because they were aggressive. They were biting them. And it would take Freiburg to, to put a new spin on that. I have a couple of follow-up questions from your really helpful descriptions of both what Winnicott and, and um, Freiburg did with young children. And my first question is that it sounds like their ideas about how children develop in the environment were a bit of a departure from some of the theorists that my students learn about early on, which is primarily they learn about Freud and Erickson's ideas. So in what ways do you see those psychoanalysts that you're drawing from to think about child development as different from that early version? It's a, it's a funny thing to muse on that. There's a, there are lots of contexts that are interesting to get into, like for example, that Freiburg was not in the beginning even accepted in the psychoanalytic world. So you, you have to know to start with that she's a bit of a rebel, though a very quiet rebel. She made no noise. She didn't fight in public with either Sigmund Freud or Anna Freud. Um, but um, she, for example, didn't give a plug nickel. She knew that she knew that the, the theories, but she didn't give a plug nickel about infant instincts or um, even sex. And you really can't be a decent Freudian at all, or so the story goes, if you're not preoccupied with sex. That's not true, by the way, but that is the common idea. And he did spend an inordinate amount of time writing and talking about it. She wasn't interested in that. She was interested more in the, the psychoanalytic principles that I think are the sturdier ones and that have stood the test of time, like you come from somewhere. You won't find that in the psychoanalytic text. That's Michael Trout's version, but I think it's a firm psychoanalytic principle. You come from somewhere. You carry your experiences with you. You have ways of remembering them, even if you can't actually remember them. They guide your behavior. They guide your behavior probably more than the instincts that Freud would have talked about. And so she always wanted to know, first and foremost, and frankly, everlastingly, that is throughout the whole of a psychotherapeutic relationship with a, with a, a child or, or a parent, she wanted to know about their history, every imaginable detail, because she knew that we all carry that with us and it guides us. Does that help to differentiate, at least in that one spectrum? Yeah, that's very helpful. And I, I think it relates to my next question. You, you said this powerful statement of, we come from somewhere, the child comes from somewhere. And throughout our conversation, you've talked about parents a bit, both how uh, Winnicott viewed parents, how you viewed parents as a home visitor, and how Freiburg had these new ideas about the parent-child relationship. 
So I know this is an enormous field of study that has become your life's work, but if you could tell a novice early childhood teacher in just a few sentences, what they should know about the mother-child relationship or why this relationship matters, what would you say to them? Oh goodness, I'd wanna put my arm around them first because this won't feel good, but I'd wanna to say to them, um, learn everything you can about children and their development and their likely behavior, learn all the diagnostic categories and then put it away and walk into this classroom or this home just eager to be taught, eager to soak up everything you see around you. If the mother says, this baby screams all the time, don't think up categories for that. Um, a pediatrician might, might look, look over your shoulder and say, oh, infant screaming at that age means the following. And it might but it's also very possible that you'll discover of all crazy things, it'll make you shake, I tell you. It make me, makes me shake when I uh, come out of a home visit like that. You might discover a story in this family that is actually why this child is screaming. You may even discover that this child is not even screaming her own screams, her own cries. She's screaming for her mother. And one, once the mother tells the story about her own loss or trauma early in her own life, lo and behold, her baby girl will stop screaming on her own and her development, which by the way, in the first home visit, when I was responding to this referral, the baby screams all the time, her development was not even a newborn level and she was six months of age. The moment mom discovered her story and spoke it out loud, the baby not only stopped screaming, but her development just scooted up very, very fast. Which is, by the way, particularly fascinating because the little girl we're talking about was a twin. And not only did her twin brother not scream, but his development was perfect. And it, his development gave us a way to measure day by day the growth in the girl's development. So I, back to, oh, I remembered suddenly that you wanted me to be specific. So I would say to the student, I wouldn't say relax, that's demeaning. I would say, be, be as calm as you can. Meditate before you get there. Be ready to learn. Have the imagination that these people in here are rocket scientists at the thing you're most interested in, which is, what's the matter? And of the three people, the mom and the baby and you, one of you doesn't know, two, or at least one, does. So it's your job to evoke that from those who know, not your job to go in there thinking you know and teach them. That's really helpful. Something that that story and your thoughts illustrate for us is that the theory or perspective that we carry in to see the child and the parents with has these big implications for what we see as our professional role with those children and how we ought to interact with them. And by the way, let me say with, with not made up empathy that I know the sort of pressures that, that the therapists and the teachers that are in your program are under now and are going to be under to meet government, so to speak, standards, to fill out the forms right, to do an assessment per a formula. I know that's true. So your students are gonna to have to face great obstacles if they wanna do anything like what we're talking about. Well, thank you for giving us some ideas about how we might start and approach that parent-child dyad in their environment. I want to thank you so much for your time today and for giving us a lot to think about. You're very welcome.